Well, good morning and welcome this sixth Sunday of Easter. Once again, recording this in my attic. And um, so it's that slightly unusual situation. But we're going to start with a prayer. Same one I used a couple of, two or three weeks ago, which was written specifically for this time of lockdown and uh, concern about the coronavirus. Do please respond when I say, Lord, hear us with the response, Lord, graciously hear us. Let us pray to God who alone makes us dwell in safety for all who are affected by coronavirus through illness or isolation or anxiety, that they may find relief and recovery. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For those who are guiding our nation at this time and shaping national policies, that they may make wise decisions. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For doctors, nurses, medical researchers and carers, that through their skill and insights, many will be restored to health. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For the vulnerable and the fearful, for the gravely ill and those who are dying, that they may know your comfort and peace. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of God. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, I pray now that you will take my words and use them to challenge us, to comfort us, to encourage us to open our eyes to your will and your purpose for our lives. In Christ's name. Amen. We're going to be looking at Psalm 66. I've taken this from the lectionary for today. Actually, it was set as verses 7 to the end, but I think we need the whole psalm, as you will see. So I'm going to begin by reading the whole of this psalm. Psalm 66. If you've got a Bible, do open it, because I think it'll be helpful to you in following my sermon to have the psalm in front of you. Shout with joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. Come and see what the God, what God has done, how awesome his works on man's behalf. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in him. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. Praise our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, O God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into prison and laid burdens on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us to a place of abundance. I will come to your temple with burnt offerings and fulfil my vows to you, vows my lips promised and my mouth spoke when I was in trouble. 
I will sacrifice fat animals to you and an offering of rams. I will offer bulls and goats. Come and listen, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and heard my voice in prayer. Praise be to God, who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. The book of Psalms has been described as the songbook of the second temple, because that's what it was. And it's not insignificant, perhaps, that it's right in the middle of our Bibles, because that is where song and worship should be right at the centre of our faith. The word psalm actually simply means a song. And these were vital, they were central to Jewish worship. Just as worship, song, music, singing today is central to much of Christian worship. Most psalms tell a story. That is, they have a beginning, a middle and an end. This one is no exception. It's divided into three four sections, as you'll see, the word salah, not quite sure what it means, but it, it suggests a kind of pause. And so we see there are those three salahs in this psalm, dividing it up into four sections. The first thing about the psalms is that they often scratch where we are itching. They may say difficult things and sometimes use language that we find difficult but they express the feelings that we all have, the hurt, the fear, the doubts, the worries, the pain, the questions. Psalm 66 is about worship in times of difficulty. Verses 1 to 4 are a call to the whole of humanity to come to praise God. Let's not forget that God calls the whole of humanity, every human being, to worship him. Verse 1, shout with joy to God all the earth. Verse 4 gives a hint as to the reason for that. All the earth bows down. In fact, the Hebrew can be translated as a future all the earth will bow down to you. They will sing praise to you. They will sing praise to your name because it's a future certainty. No one will have any choice about that. It could also be translated as all the earth should bow down to you. They should sing your praise. They should sing praise to your name. That is, it's an obligation. This is not optional. It reminds us of Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 to 11, where we read, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. No exceptions. The reason these words in Psalm 66 are addressed to all the earth is that God is God of everyone of all the earth. God is God of the Jew. God is the God of the Muslim. God is the God of the atheist. Even the staunchest atheist, the staunchest unbeliever, will have to bow before Jesus. You see, because God, the one God, is everyone's God, whether people believe in him or not. You know, believing the world is flat... <laughs> doesn't stop it from being a sphere. Not believing in God doesn't stop God from existing. No wonder the psalmist writes in verse 5, come and see what God has done. Many people get a bit nervous about evangelism. 
they're fearful that they'll get it wrong or not be able to explain something or that they'll be perceived as pushy or arrogant or, you know, whatever. I think sometimes the best evangelism is simply testimony. Telling your story, because every one of us, those who've been brought up in Christian families, those who have had sudden and dramatic conversion experiences, have a story to tell. We can say to people why God is important to us. Effectively, that's what the psalmist does here. Verses 5 and 6, come and see what God has done, how awesome his works on man's behalf. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in him. He invites them to examine the Jewish faith, the story of their faith, which, of course, highlights the, and he highlights the exodus and their escape, their liberation for the oppression they were experiencing in Egypt. So often people are convinced when they look at the evidence themselves. I remember when I was at school, um, a man called Anthony Bloom, who was the head of the Russian Orthodox Church in the UK in those days, um, came and spoke to the school. And you could have heard a pin drop as he spoke. He was just an amazing man. And he told about his own conversion and how he had um, at one stage thought the Bible must be nonsense. And so he chose to read the Bible himself, himself and he chose the shortest book, the shortest gospel to read, which was Mark's gospel. And he said by the time he got to chapter eight, he was just aware of Jesus standing in the room. And that transformed his life. What about us? Sometimes we simply need to share our story. For the Jews, that included the Passover, the Red Sea, and of course later the exile and all those things. For us, it will include the cross and the resurrection. But it will also include our own personal encounter with Jesus, the living God. It's worth sometimes reflecting on how we would tell that story. The next section here is verses 8 to 15, and you'll see that it is divided into two parts. It moves from addressing everyone to addressing a particular people and then to an individual. See here in verse 8 how God is now referred to as our God. No longer looking at God as God of just everyone and everyone. He is our God. Praise our God, O peoples. And he starts to reflect on the suffering of God's people. It's good to remember that we are part of something big. It's right to care for the sufferings of those of other denominations and of other nations Jew and Gentile, where they're facing struggles because of their Christian faith. Because the truth is that we are one people. We would say that one people is the church. But being God's people doesn't exempt you from suffering, persecution and the ills of this world. Verse 16 here is key. For you, O God, tested us. You refined us like silver. The image of the refiner's fire is, of course, taken up elsewhere in Scripture. I often think of um, Malachi chapter 3, you know, famously part of the Messiah, Handel's Messiah. He is like a refiner's fire. In the first letter of Peter, we read in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have, have, may have had to suffer grief of all kinds of trials. These have come, this is the key thing, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine 
and may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. The image, of course, of refining is to do with the way silver and gold are purified by melting those metals and burning off all the impurities. Sometimes when life gets tough, that's what happens to us. The impurities start to be burnt off. I can think of when I went to Kenya helping out with Pat and a number of others from our church um, it, with a, a charity in the, the poorest part of Mombasa. And I just remember the little children sometimes not wearing you know, clothes with holes in and tatty and unkempt, and yet their smiles, their joy was immense. And it was just incredible to see them. I can see the same in my own life too. Sometimes the difficult times have actually proved to be the most profitable. I remember hearing Rick and Kay Warren um, talking about the way they had grown in their faith through the suicide of their son just a few months earlier. It was hard, it was difficult, and yet somehow they discovered the reality of God in a way which they wouldn't have if such a tragedy hadn't occurred. Notice how this con situation, this, um, this section continues. Verse 11, you brought us into prison. Again, it made me think of lockdown. We may feel that that's a hardship that we're having to face. We may say, why? You brought us into prison and laid burdens on us, on our backs. You let us ri let men ride over our heads. And we went through fire and water. In other words, every destructive force, you know, floods and everything. But, as so often that's the key word here, but you brought us to a place of abundance. In the psalmist mind, that's, the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. For the Christian, of course, we have a tremendous hope, the new creation. I came across this quotation from A.W. Tozer, a great Christian um, of a previous generation, who said, did you ever stop to think that God is going to be as pleased to have you with him in heaven as you are to be there? A tremendous thought. You see, heaven is going to be good. We have something great and wonderful to look forward to. Eternity is going to be fun. <laughs> but in the here and now, we need refining. If only so that our story can become more credible, more relatable to, and others might find the love of God also. The second section here within this, um, this um, section moves to the individual. It's spoken of the church, the community of God's people and their experiences and struggles. And now it removes to the individual. Sometimes the events of the so-called Reformation in the 16th century have been criticised for producing a version of Christian of the Christian faith which is too individualistic. People used to talk about taking my communion. I don't know if you've come across that. And rightly, the Nicene Creed in common worship has been retranslated. Because in the Book of Common Prayer, which came out of the Reformation, it said, I believe in God. The original one didn't say that, but in common worship, it's we believe, which is what the original said. And sometimes we can be too individualistic. However, it's important to remember that we do have responsibility for our own salvation. Verses 13 and 14 here. I will come to your temple with burnt offerings and fulfil my vows to you. Vows my lips promised and my mouth spoke when I was in trouble. Vows 
my mouth, my lips promised and my mouth spoke when I was in trouble. Again, my thoughts went to lockdown. And perhaps as we see the light at the beginning, at the end of the tunnel, are we going simply to return to life as it was? Many have spoken of the way in which lockdown has made them become aware of all that we have or had. And therefore to be more grateful for the air we breathe, for our freedoms, to see that the freedoms to see those we love, to hug those we love, to go to a show, to eat in a restaurant, to go on holiday, to worship. And the list goes on. Have we, during this period of lockdown, made a vow, perhaps unspoken, not to let those things go for granted? And then the final section of the psalm returns to the theme of the beginning. Verse 5 said, come and see what God has done. Verse 16 here says, come and listen, all you who fear God. It's true that not everyone fears God, although the gospel is addressed to all. We know from the parable of the sower that not all hear, not all respond to that. But when we do proclaim the good news of Jesus, some will respond. Once again, the psalmist speaks of his own experience. He says in verses 19 and 20, God has surely listened and heard my voice in prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. We are called to do the same. To share our faith, to call people, to come and listen to the voice of God, to the truth of Jesus. Let us pray. And today's special prayer, the collect for today, God our Redeemer, you have redeemed us, you have delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. Grant that as by his death, he has recalled us to life. So by his continual presence in us, he may raise us to eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And if you would, do please join with me in saying the prayer that Jesus taught us and a prayer that unites all true Christians. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.